Thank you, honey. She's the only person in the choir I call honey. <laughs> you know, I was thinking as she sang that song, I sure am glad she's holding my hand and the Lord's holding our hands. We looked last week at Genesis chapter 2, God's design for man and woman. Um, all the animals and man were made from the dirt. Eve was made from the very side of Adam. They belonged together. And I want us to continue that conversation about God's design for man and woman. In the Old Testament, the two leave their families and become one for a lifetime. In the New Testament, you see that we're given the message of, of what it looks like on the day-to-day. -day. How do we get through it? How do we live in relationship with other folks? Because it's a difficult thing. And uh, God's given us some promises and truth to guide us through this. See, God's design is perfect. And if you know what God's word says about man and woman, then when you see what the world says about man and woman, God's design will correct what they say. Because we know that God's word is truth. It's God's design. This is the way it meant, is meant to be. Well, you say, Philip, what if, and this, and this is true in our culture, what if I have an attraction to someone of the same sex? Or what if I believe, Philip, that God has made me as one sex and I really want to be another sex? I mean, those are questions that are talked about all the time. Well, it's just like anything else in your life. Go to God's Word. See what it says. Conform yourself to the Word. Don't conform yourself to the world because they're seeking to deceive, destroy, and kill. Marriages and men and women. That's what the Bible says, John chapter 10. So when you hear God's Word, we conform and hear it. Now, don't mishear me. You may have something that's off kilter from God's word in your life, in your family. But I'm telling you, friend, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't disbelieve what God can do in all our lives. Amen. Amen. Will you stand in honor of God's word? Our text for the morning is Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, verse 33. I think it's the first sermon I've ever preached, which is really a, 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 a sentence that's not with a period on it. Hear God's word. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. If you have a Bible, underline that. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and his himself, it, the church, Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself, as we've sung about this morning, in splendor. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Father, we come before you today. We come to the very living word of God. And we pray that you would accomplish your purpose in our hearts today. That you would minister to us and through us, through your word. We need your guidance. We need your help. 
and we cry out for your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, when you look at this text, the very first verse in this section is verse 21. It says, submitting to one another in fear and our reverence for Christ. This household code carries all the way through chapter 6, verse 9. Submitting. It would say this. If you are a slave, submit to your masters. I think that would probably uh, transpose here. If, if you are working for somebody, submit to the people that you're working for. If you are a child, and by child I mean this. If your hand is still in the pocket of your mama or your daddy, you have someone else that's supporting you. Your responsibility, whether you like it, whether you agree with it, is submit to your parents. And then in this marital relationship, there's a submission that the man and the woman has to God. Most of the time, we look at this submission sort of Spouse to spouse, rather than Lord to spouse. There must be a proper order in God's design. The first thing you're doing, ultimately you're submitting to Him when you love her, when you submit to Him, when you respect Him. And when you get that out of kilter, the whole combination is all for God's design. This word submit means to be or become inclined are willing to submit to orders or wishes of others are showing such inclination. Do you know what the opposite word for submit is? Anybody want to take a guess? Some of you smarter ones? Yeah, do not submit. It's defiance. You see, when non-submission is a part of the marriage a part of the household with children, a part of your life, when there's non-submission, it's defiance not only to this person here, but to this one here. When God directs us to submit, we don't defy what he says to do. And so the responsibility here is individual. If the man goes to the woman, you need to submit to me. There's going to be a problem. But if the woman goes to the Lord and submits under his care, it changes everything. And I think so often we read it in the wrong way without understanding that in verse 21, submitting to one another is a part of the marital relationship. You say, preacher, I wasn't taught that way. Well, I'm telling you what the Bible says. And if you've got a problem with that, look and see what God's Word says in verse 21. And, and I think it can change everything. I think it could get us right back on the, the place that God wants us to be. Look at verses 22 and 24. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now husbands, let me say something to you right here. You are not Christ, neither am I. It's a comparison. He says, as Christ. And so, uh, wives, you, you're to reverence God in submitting to your husband in whatever that might look like. Now, uh, some folks might frame it this way. They might say, well, uh, honey, if you submit to me, I want uh, three meals and a snack. <laughs> I want it daily. Or, you know, I want you to, you know, cut my toenails. I mean, whatever it is. And, and so that becomes between the wife and her husband sh rather than between the wife and her Lord. Uh, you don't have to tell her because I think God's directing her in what she ought to do. And then because the man's also following Christ, both of them are, are connected this way first, priority, versus this way. Does that make sense? And when this, your relationship with God, rules the relationships you have with others at work, at home, and in marriages, it changes everything. But we've allowed the world to speak this non-design into our lives. We've made it about things that the Word doesn't say, but that the Word, the world encourages. 
So men and women are often pupped up, head button, Mountain Dew billy goats. Y'all seen that Mountain Dew commercial that come out some years ago? I mean, it's, great. it's one of the greatest commercials, I think. These long, horned, proud, strong goats on a mountain look at one another and come at each other with the top of their head. And, and, and when the world begins to dictate how you look at your spouse, it changes everything. As a matter of fact, I never will forget I was doing a marriage of someone in my family. I said, now you got to go through counseling, got to go through counseling. They didn't go through counseling. But they said, preacher, we want to tell you this. We do not want you to use this passage, this verse that I just read, in our marriage ceremony. And, it's, and this is why. When the world begins to determine what you think and what you do in your home, in your job, and in every relationship you have, it messes up everything. Satan begins to steal. He begins to kill. He begins to wreck marriages. Because we live in a world of self-grandizement. I mean, we, we elevate our mind and our thinking and how we, we think things. And I believe we need to come back to God's word and submit to it. God's design for man and woman is what's being described here with the op opposite sex. When all these other things come in, uh, let me give you an example. If you know God's design for you, a spouse, is to be one with your spouse, you're not going to get on the internet watching pornography because you're going to realize that pornography, men and women, will wreck your relationship with your wife. You're going to be, begin to realize that, that when you're mad at your spouse and you want attention somewhere else, that God's design is you to be one with your husband, and it'll cut off you looking somewhere else for relationship satisfaction. See, God's design will do away with what the world says about things. And I just want to encourage you young people, watch out on these dating relationships where they're ruled by the local high school thought. Because it'll wreck your life and it'll steal your body from you. And then I want to tell you this. If you'll repent and turn back to God, he'll restore both. That's true. But the word must drive us, not the world. I recently had the opportunity to speak with a young couple who waited. They waited on kissing and hugging. They waited on all those things. Now, I know that's not the norm. But I was so in admiration of a couple that believed God's word in such a way that they wanted his design for their marriage. And I just want to encourage you, whether you've had that or not, you might not have had that, but I'm telling you what, God will renew you. God will give you hope. God will give you the one. Trust him and his design. Submit to him because that's what this whole section is talking about in Ephesians chapter 17 and verse 18. It says it this way, therefore do not be foolish, but understand, underline this word, what the will of the Lord is. It's not your will, it's not my will, it's his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a crucial understanding of your life that God made you, He created you, that He loves you, and He's got a plan or He's got a will for your life. Don't quit on Him. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. What that means, that word debauchery, man, that's a great word. I want to make sure I get this right. It means that you're hopelessly sick. You're the prodigal son that took everything his dad had given him and squandered it in worldly living. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But the contrast is be filled with the Spirit of God. And, and, and I, would, I would just, that's important to understand. That's what rules this text when he's talking about household relationships. He's talking about being filled with the Spirit of God. Now, I'm going to tell you all something. This is just my view. I was sitting down front by the piano today. Man, I'm telling you, y'all were singing so loud, I could hardly hear myself singing. I said, I was thinking, man, I hope you ain't off key. 
But the Spirit of God was reminding us of who he is and what he's done. He saved us. He's loved us. He's never quit on us. Worship. Filled with the Spirit of God. That's important. Are you filled with the Spirit of God? Are you looking for God's will in your marriage, in your job, and in your placement? Because I'm telling you something. It might not be the easiest thing you've ever done. But I'll tell you what. You're never going to meet anybody that followed God's way that, that regrets what they've done. It reminds me of this. Uh, I've used this before. And man, we were, Daniel and I were at a red, wedding rehearsal the other day, and I think about two weeks ago. And man, it was sort of, you know, I'm just sort of watching. Daniel's leading the wedding, and I'm just sort of watching everything. And I don't know about you, but I was a little bit nervous. I get nervous at every rehearsal. You never know. A mother-in-law that's out of the way or something like that. <laughs> no offense to any mother-in-laws. God bless you. But this girl, this bride was nervous. And the pastor comes up to her and she said, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. He said, well, I tell you what, just, just think of it this way. You're going to be in the church, and, and you're going to come down the aisle. So just think aisle first. And then you're coming to the altar, right? You're going to see our deacons at the end of this service. They're all going to come and kneel at the altar. Those that have good knees and those that can't, well, they're going to sit on the front row. But they're coming to God because they want to be altered by him. She said, so the first thing you think is aisle. Second thing you think is altar. And then you look at your groom. And man, on that morning... They was getting married, and she was going down the aisle. I'll alter him. <laughs> now, ladies, mm, uh, be good. Listen, if you don't get anything else today, get this. If you allow him to alter you, it'll change your work, your worship, your family. Change everything. He has to do the altering, not us. And I just want to say something. If you're newly married in here, and I don't know if we have anybody that's newly married, if you've been married 20 years, if your view is to alter your spouse and not be altered by God, I'm telling you, your marriage ain't where it needs to be. He, God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, He alters us. The culture of our day wants independence. Our way, not God's way. In our homes, in our work, in our school. I wonder how many... Now, I love teachers, amen? I don't have time to tell it. How do wives submit to their Lord and husbands? You put God first in your submission. God, how would you have me treat him? Now listen, I, I realize that the people that are in here today, that some of your marriages aren't where they need to be. And I didn't know that when I got here. I didn't even know why God wanted me to preach this. But I'm going to tell you something. His way is the right way. Allow him to alter you in your relationship with your spouse. Let's see what God does. Remember, to depend on God's will for direction in your life. That your purpose by God was given that you too might be. That there's a priority of your spouse over others. And then I want to encourage you this. Pray together for God's will. At the table, in the bed, in the mornings. Pray together for God's will to be done in your home. Can you imagine the testimony to this culture and to our children? If our children begin to see us doing it God's way, God altering us. You say, Philip, I've lost those things in my marriage. Listen to me. Philip, my marriage is not where it needs to be. Tell God about it. I'm sorry, God, my marriage ain't what it needs to be. I'm coming to you today for renewal. And I'm going to tell you something about God. There's nobody that has ever come to him. He said, no, I'm not messing with you no more. You're a mess. 
You've done this over and over and over and over again. You're stubborn. He never says that. He says, just like the prodigal who'd squandered everything he had, and when he came back, his father said, let's throw a party. My child's home. And that's what God says to people. Repent. The Bible says that angels in heaven rejoice over one person that repent. And you know, repent's become a four-letter word. Repent is a gateway to connection with God. <laughs> and I want to say something to you. If God is drawing you to turn to Him, turn to Him today. His grace will meet you there. Spirit-filled people follow God's design. Spirit-filled people follow God's direction. Let's look at verses 25 through 30. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Think about that for a second, guys. And gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water and the word. Listen. Men, what does it look like for us to love our wives like Christ loved the church? What does that look like? You know, I've been wrestling with this text all week, and I've had a very difficult time in, in trying to find the application for it. I thought about this. I thought about the song, Outrageous Love. It says, it wasn't the nails you see that held him to the tree. Outrageous love. It was more than history. He was there for you and me. And I began to think that he gave his life so that I might live and have freedom. What must it look like in my relationship with my wife and your relationship with your wife? What does that kind of love look like? Love that never quits. Love that never gives up. Winston Churchill was in a meeting in London and this question was asked, if you could not be who you are, who would you like to be? You know, all the people coming up with some good answers, you know, probably. Doesn't tell what they said, but Churchill said this, if I could not be who I am, I would most like to be Clemmy. Churchill's second husband. Now, I want to tell you something, friend. Can you imagine what it would be like for a man to say that his wife was loved by him in such a way that if he had another life to live, he wanted to live it for her and with her. Now, men, that's the responsibility or the opportunity that we have with our spouse. And I'm like my wife. I want to confess, I hadn't always done like, like I'm supposed to do it. I've been hard-headed, stubborn, but I aspire for more. What about you? What about God's bride? Jesus. For me, it was in the garden. He prayed. Not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. That's his example. He gave all he had to change the world. That's what he's talking about when he says, Husbands, love your wives. Look what the Lord has done. Look what he's done for you and for me. Husbands, look at what he's done for us so we can do what he'd have us do in our hearts, in our homes, with our wives and with our children. I told you I grappled with this. I had just uh, had an argument with one of my family members, and I don't like to tell you, you know, they've already given me a cup. Be careful what you say. You'll be in the sermon today. Um, Why y'all laughing at me? <laughs> y'all don't laugh at the rest of my family. My wife said this morning she's going to get a part in the bulletin. I hope she don't do it. She said it's going to be Pastor's Wives Corner. And she's going <laughs> to... 
submit to the Lord. <laughs> but listen, if anybody knows I'm not perfect, it's me and my family. And I was really grappling. Hey, hey, how do I do this? And I'd had an argument with my family members. I was hot as a firecracker. I felt disrespected. And I walked away from the situation so I didn't do anything. But in my heart, y'all ever do that? No, I know y'all don't. But anyway, <laughs> at least you got a faulty preacher. I was grappling, man. And I came across this text. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wrong. Man, that struck me. That I need to quit keeping a record. A file cabinet full. Verse 6. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. And then verse 7. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith is always hopeful and listen to this and endures through every circumstances I know that the circumstances in your life may not be what you want them to be but I want to tell you something because he's loved us we can live through it anyway we cannot give up we can endure we can press on no matter our circumstances. And I believe God's miracles are going to be known because there's some people that take a verse like this and apply it in their marriage. They don't give up. They don't quit. They never allow the circumstances to determine. Now you say, Philip, I can't do that. I can't either. But i tell you what, God can make you able to do it because he's never going to call you to do something and not make us able to do it. We love them. Just like he loves us. Hey, guys, you ever thought about how patient God's been with us? You ever thought about how many times that God could have folded me up like an old piece of paper and put me in the garbage? Amen. Yeah. Or this, how many times he's forgiven us? Spirit-filled people follow God's design. I'm going to make this contrast. Most of us have some kind of social min uh, media, whatever it might be. I don't know what yours is. This is not about social media. But I want to tell you that this world and social media are pushing a worldly agenda. It's about people's opinions, what feels good to us. God's design is something different. Follow God's design for your life, for your marriage, for your relationships with other people. Follow God's design in your work. Spirit-filled people follow God's design. Secondly, spirit-filled people follow God's direction. I believe that God wanted to speak to me this week, and maybe I'm the only one in here. I don't think so. I think God knew you were going to be here, and he loves you. I think he wanted to speak to you and encourage you. He'll remind you that don't let the circumstances control you, that the Christ has got control of your life. And he loves you. Don't measure it by worldly measures. Let me say it a different way. I don't know what has been in your marriage, but I know what can be. Don't measure your life by what has happened, 
but what God can do. They're different things. Don't measure yourself by what has happened. Or where you're not in God's design, cry out for God's design. Verse 32 and 33, it says, This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I want to change this little triangle thing that we've made it sort of like us and then God. I'm going to tell you, the priority of the triangle is God, then us. Go to him, men, as you love her. Ladies, now people say this to my wife all the time. I don't see how you put up with him. I tell you how. She's a born-again, blood-bought, Lord-following girl. Amen. That's how every woman puts up with every man. Amen? Amen. That's how every man puts up too. It's our relationship with him that must govern our home. I don't know where you're at today, but I pray that you'd allow him to alter your marriage. Come, kneel before him. God help us. Or maybe, you, maybe you're at a place in your life where you, you don't even know if you know him. Maybe, maybe you need to start this morning with a relationship with God, that he's your Lord and Savior. And I want to ask you to come. The Bible says, as many as will receive them, to you he'll give eternal life. Respond to him this morning. Follow his design. As you stand, every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, come before you today. and Just, just to pray, Lord, your glory be known. Let your word go forth and give seed 30, 60, 100 fold. That you'd encourage those that have been, maybe came in here discouraged. Or I don't know, Lord, I don't know people like you do. But would you just minister to marriages across this land? Would you heal and help us to forgive if there's any mess that's happened, Lord, to start anew right now this morning? Lord, we just pray that you'd have your way. Have your way, please, Lord. For we ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. You respond as God leads you. part of our worship service today we pray that you'd experience God's grace or his word and because we can't see you but you can see us we want you to know that we care about you and there may be a need that you have a prayer concern uh, maybe you want to know more about uh, our Lord and Savior and we want to be there to help you to connect with you so we want to put on the screen a number that you could call we'd love to be in touch with you and help you in any way we can. Uh, also, uh, you may have something that you need a pastor for, and we'd like to meet that need for you as well. Call us. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for being with us. May God bless you.